Good afternoon, everyone. We're going to get started. Welcome to the 2019 Foster Youth Internship Congressional Briefing. Um, the 12 amazing individuals here have been waiting for this day for the better part of a year. So um, uh, my job is just to tell you a little bit about CCAI and a little bit about the program and introduce them to you and then get out of the way. Um, CCAI, the Congressional Coalition on Adoption Institute, was founded in 2001 to partner with the Congressional Coalition on Adoption, which is the largest bipartisan bicameral caucus in Congress. Um, so we were founded by Congress for Congress. Our founding board was four members of Congress. And um, the idea of all of our programs and all the work that we do is to bring lawmakers face to face with the children, youth, and families who are affected firsthand by child welfare policy. And um, so this is really the premier program that does that. Um, the Foster Youth Intern Program was established in 2003, so we are in um, year 17 of the program. And it's a rigorous application process that takes a couple months of interviews and vetting. Um, and so thousands have applied, and there's a group of about 200 alumni of the program now. So at the end of the summer, these 12 will join those ranks. And the internship really has two parts. So by day, they serve as congressional interns in both the House and the Senate. And at night and on the weekends, they work on their policy reports, which they are presenting to you today. Um, there are a lot of deadlines and a lot of frustrations and a lot of work that goes into that process. But basically, all of them wrestled with two questions, which is, what is a key part of my story and my experience in foster care that made a pivotal impact in my life? Or what is something that could have made a pivotal impact in my experience that I want other youth who are still in care to have? Um, and those are not always easy questions to wrestle with, let alone to find sort of practical application policy solutions to. So here they are. Um, I'm just going to go down the line. And we do have a couple of members of Congress who will be joining us both during the briefing and during the, the um, reception. So we'll just pause the program whenever they are able to join us and um, let them say a few words. Um, so starting at the end, we have Anna Zhang. Um, from North Carolina, North Carolina and now Florida. Um, Anthony Abshire from California. Joshua Christian from Indiana. Lily Corey from Washington. Cherie Hickman from California. David Hall from Oklahoma. Alex Olson from Kansas City, Missouri. Mackenzie McGeehan from Pennsylvania. Lino Pena Martinez from California. Christopher Scott from Connecticut. Alexandra Talski from Wisconsin. And Raya Esteves from New Jersey. Um, and before we kick off their remarks, I just wanted to acknowledge a few of the organizations and the network that really is the muscle behind the work that we do, and we couldn't do it without them, um, starting with our volunteer board of directors. So CCAI is a nonprofit, and we have two of them in the room. And I didn't ask them if they wanted to stand up or be acknowledged, but Russ Sullivan, who you used <laughs> And our new board member, Rita Lewis. And so both of them, Rita just joined the board and we're so thrilled um, because both of them served on the Hill. Um, our board is really an incredible, dedicated um, task force that helps keep everything going. Um, we also have platinum and gold sponsors that I wanted to acknowledge. And those are the Dave Thomas Foundation for Adoption, the Carlson Family Foundation, Jack and Claudette Gerard, Jockey Bing Family, the American Council of Life Insurers, the Annie E. Casey Foundation, the Luzerne Foundation, Scott and Carrie Hassenbach, and Retail Orphan Initiative. 
I also wanted to acknowledge some of the organizations that work with us in different ways throughout the summer and our, um, our FYI Foster Youth Intern Program partners. That's Adams and Reese, Arnold and Porter, Brownstein Hyatt Farber Shrek, One Simple Wish, the amazing CCAI staff, um, Case, and two others that I would also like to ask to stand, and that is Megan Lestino and the child focus team, Rebecca Roebuck and Mary Bissell. Would you stand? <laughs> um, it's impossible to tell you all the ways they went above and beyond, but the FYIs are nodding because they know they were just part of the family this summer. Um, do we have a member here? Okay, oh, Congresswoman um, Lauren Underwood from Florida is actually Illinois. <laughs> Uh, I downloaded a lot of member bios before walking over. Um, <laughs> it's actually one of our host offices this summer, and she hosted Anna. And so we wanted to have you come up and say a few remarks, if you're willing. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm so excited about the briefing this afternoon. Um, I've been in Congress for all of six months. And early in our tenure, uh, we had a tragedy that struck our community in northern Illinois when a five-year-old boy named AJ Friend was killed, allegedly by his parents, after being returned back to their custody, um, I think in part because of some um, in inadequate supply of foster parents uh, and inadequate oversight over the Department of Children and Family Services in the state of Illinois. And so um, when AJ died, we went to his funeral, and the community was just um, awed, candidly, that this type of child abuse was happening in our community, that there were so many children that couldn't find placement in, our, in the county, in our district, that they were being sent all around the state, and that this was a real need that was happening here, and that nobody knew, seemingly nobody knew. And so we began working on the issue. Uh, my Committee on Education and Labor has jurisdiction over some child abuse work, and we passed a stronger CAPTA bill out of committee uh, in the spring. But we also know oh, we also know that there's more work to be done. And so I was so thrilled, so thrilled to have Anna Zhang contribute her talent and her creativity to our office to dig into these issues. And so pleased that so many of you are here to um, hear their recommendations um, and ways that the Congress can act to make sure that no child um, is failed by the system in the way that AJ was in our community. So I'm honored to be able to do this work, so honored to be able to partner with all of you in these efforts that I know will continue forward for years to come. I also recognize that there is a young woman here from Illinois, Allison Myers, and I don't know where she is. Oh, hi, Allison, um, but would love to sit and talk with you and learn about your experience as well. Thank you all for your work. Uh, thank you for creating this opportunity this afternoon for members like me to hear directly from all of you, and I uh, look forward to implementing many of your recommendations. Take care, everybody. Thank you, Congresswoman. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to the people that you're here to see. So I'll call up Alex Olson and Raya Esteves, and they are going to kick off the presentation of the 2019 Foster Youth Intern Report. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Alex Olson. And my name is Raya Esteves. And we are members of your 2019 Foster Youth Internship Cohort. Today, myself and 11 of my colleagues here come to you speaking because we believe in a system of government that is receptive to the needs of the people. Our lives have all been shaped by our experiences in the child welfare system. The 12 of us speak to you today as partners. We understand that our expertise that come from our lived experiences and your platforms can truly create a better future. Each and every one of us has had a different experience, a different outlook on life. But all of us from the Congressional Coalition on Adoption Institute care, 
as you all do, about the well-being of youth in the foster care system. We urge that you listen as we echo the voices of not only us, but millions of youth that have been through and are currently in the United States foster care system. This is a powerful meeting place. You are all here, regardless of your differing stances on issues, to truly learn, to take note of our ideas, and to channel our combined passions to truly, truly create real change for current and future youth. This summer, we have had the honor and privilege of bringing our stories to life, but beyond that, to bring them here. Thanks to CCAI, members of Congress, and the many individuals and organizations we've had the opportunity to meet with this summer, we have put together recommendations that encompass each aspect of the threefold mission of the child welfare system, safety, permanency, and well-being. I once had the opportunity to speak with a man who is wheelchair bound and dedicates his life to public policy work. He made this point. We, at no fault of our own, cannot see the issues and gaps in policy if it does not disadvantage us. Therefore, we have to turn our eyes and ears to the people who are living with the side effects. We are those people. It is important to remember that the recommendations we have for you today are not the result of a research project or term paper, but the product of our lived experiences. Boundless futures the idea of tearing down the many barriers foster youth face in their journeys to success. We hope that today you take the opportunity to learn about the gaps in our system, how they affected each and every one of us, how they affect those who cannot be at this table, and how we hope to see them change. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Anna Zhang. I would like to thank you all for your time today, and I would also like to thank CCAI, my policy advisor, Jane, and the Office of Honorable Congresswoman, Lauren Underwood. Today, I would like to talk about a prominent issue in the child welfare system across the United States, placement instability. I spent four years in the foster care system, and during that time, I lived in over 10 different homes. The constant moves impacted my mental health disrupted my education, and made it extremely difficult for me to make meaningful connections, even in adulthood. My first placement change was the hardest. I was forced to move late on a school night without any prior notification or a reason why. I was just given a trash bag and 10 minutes to pack up my entire life. Within 24 hours, I had moved 30 miles away, changed schools, and was separated from my sister. This instability became a constant cycle in my life. Many of my foster care placements were di disrupted for two main reasons. The lack of compatibility with my foster family or their disregard for my desire to remain connected with my biological family. The cycle finally ended when one foster parent took the time to get to know me. She nurtured the bond between my biological family and I by inviting my sister over for sleepovers and also inviting my dad over for holidays. She even made sure that I looked pretty for my homeschool, my homecoming high school dance. For the past 10 years, more than 130,000 or approximately 37% of foster youth have experienced two or more placements each year. There is a need to implement innovative strategies to minimize placement change for youth in foster care. The first placement a child encounters should be the best and the last placement. First, Congress should require all states to expand the use of matching technology and innovative solutions as part of the Title IV-B Diligent Foster Family Recruitment Plans. The matching strategies um, should consider such characteristics as family dynamics, placement, age, and special needs. Studies have shown that using this technology to match youth to prospective foster care placements reduced the changes by 22%. Second, HHS has already established the Center for Excellence in Foster Family Development to help some states improve foster and birth parent partnerships and increase successful reunification, but the center does not go far enough. All states should be required to plan for and report back on how they are supporting these relationships 
and access the technical assistance they need to succeed. Finally, youth in foster care should have a meaningful voice if a placement change should occur. Current law requires states to provide youth starting at age 14 with a case plan that includes a list of rights with respect to education, health, and other important matters. The federal government should require all states to include the right to notice of placement change removal and a review process as part of that list. To go further, a law should restrict particularly traumatic placement moves between the hours of 9 p.m. and 7 a.m. Today I shared my story, which is just one of many. I have provided the facts and possible solutions. I urge Congress to act. By adopting my recommendations, Congress can make these important changes and improve the lives of children in the foster care system. Our children are our future. Thank you. Liar, feral, mentally retarded. These are the words I read in my case file that were used to describe me after entering the foster care system. Given my behavior, the language I used, and any lack of formalized education, and the abuse that I experienced at the hands of my biological family, I can understand how my caseworkers came to this conclusion. Having lived experience in 45 foster homes, a group home, and a psychiatric institution, this did not change anyone's mind about me. This, sorry, this left me uh, feeling abandoned and alone. I felt as if I could only rely on myself and no one was willing to or going to help me. Having this support would have changed a lot about my story because I would have known that someone cared and that I mattered. This is not unique to my experience in the foster care system. While I was in care, I often blamed my child welfare workers for the poor responses to the reports of abuse and neglect. What I realize now, though, is that my child welfare workers may just not have been able to deal with them. It wasn't until I studied social work that I understood or even cared about the realities that child welfare workers had to go through on a daily basis. 44% of child welfare workers experience burnout in the first 13 months of being employed. Research shows that poor personal relationships and high job demands lead to depersonalization and emotional exhaustion, which are two key factors in job, uh, experiencing burnout. Child welfare workers are asked to care for the most vulnerable youth in our society, and we ask them to do this with very little support. Title IV-E and Title IV-B allow for administrative dollars to be used for specific types of training for child welfare and other on-the-job needs. However, this money is not allowed to support uh, the mental health and well-being of these workers. I am asking Congress to do the following. First, expand evidence-based models that divide the responsibilities of child welfare workers so that they experience less stress and more support in their decision making. Second, build states' capacities to employ paraprofessionals who can assist child welfare workers with their administrative task. Uh, using Title IV-B and 4E funds. Finally, uh, fund a quality improvement center research study that consists of foster youth, foster parents, and child welfare workers to determine what is working well in the foster care system and what needs improvement. Making these changes will help reduce burnout among child welfare workers, leading to better outcomes for youth on their caseload. I would like to thank CCAI, my policy advisor, and the office of Congressman James Langevin, who hosted me this summer, for allowing me to be here. Thank you. My name is Joshua Christian, and I'm a senior in college and an intern here in the Senate. More importantly, I was in foster care for about 18 years. I have received two national awards for my advocacy for young people who are in similar shoes. Young people in foster care show 
significant determinants in education, mental health, and social skills, all of which are keys to success and happiness. Throughout the 18 years, I had a total of 18 separate placements. I wanted to go back to the one familiar place I knew, so I used all my birthday wishes until I turned 13 to go back to an unhealthy biological home. For four years, my siblings and I received various forms of serious abuse, all of which went unnoted by five teachers that spent eight hours a day with us and were responsible for our well-being. I attended four different high schools, each of which differed wildly in content, structure, and capability. I attended four. In the midst of these transfers, I lost credits and fell behind in my education. To make matters worse, I did not have access to my schoolwork and group homes. Informing you of my story is important. It provides the necessary context for statistics showing that over 90% of foster children experience PTSD symptoms, more than twice the rate as our US war veterans. This might also explain why 25% of foster children receive neither a high school diploma or a GED, more than twice the rate of the general student population. I came here for action because if not you, then who, and if not now, then when? So first, I urge Congress to pass the Trauma-Informed Schools Act to help teachers receive training of trauma and its impact on learning. For all young people in foster care, teachers are a primary point of contact and are on the front lines and are currently unarmed in this battle. Second, Congress should amend the Family First Act to add an education provision for group home licensure. It is entirely unacceptable that young people in foster care are not provided with ample educational resources. Any group home that, deny, that denies us those resources are outright denying us our future. Third, as an incentive, Congress should require states applying for Title I funding through the Every Student Succeeds Act to collect in-depth educational data on young people in foster care. To help young people, states need to consistently be collecting educational data to have an understanding on how to improve educational outcomes. Fourth, and my final recommendation, Congress should increase monitoring of the data collection requirements in the Every Student Succeeds Act. We are not just random numbers. We are humans, and it is dangerous and unacceptable for states to try and provide services to improve the well-being of young people without adequate data. I'm incredibly thankful for Senator Grassley, CCAI, CCAI Child Focus, Sarah Catherine, Ryan Martin, my forever family, and everyone back home for making this opportunity a reality. I'm excited to see what the future holds. For as long as I could remember, my parents struggled with domestic violence, incarceration, poverty, and substance use. Those struggles tore through my family, eventually leading my brother and me into foster care with my aunt. Even though my aunt was caring for two of her own children and working a full-time job in childcare, she opened her doors to us and became our kinship foster parent. Once she began receiving a foster care stipend, it gave us the stability we didn't previously have. We were able to access clothing vouchers, financial support for other basic items, and activities like summer camp. The only reason she was able to keep us in her home was because of this additional state support. If it weren't for my aunt stepping up, I would not be here today. Unfortunately, there are many other kinship families that do not receive financial support, even though they provide the same stability to children who have been diverted from foster care. For every child in foster care with relatives, there are 20 children being raised by family outside of the foster care system. These families provide the same care as foster parents and deserve access to the same services that other kinship and non-relative foster families receive. 
The Family First Act provides funding for important prevention services for children living with relatives. But the list of eligible services should be expanded to include legal services, childcare, and money for basic needs. These are critical necessities that families don't often have extra funds to cover. Next, there should be a child-only Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, or SNAP, benefit. The high cost of food is a huge issue for relatives who are already financially vulnerable. Just as there is already a child-only benefit provided by temporary assistance to needy families, or TANF, Congress should create a similar benefit for food assistance to help children being cared for by relatives. Finally, previous legislation like the Fostering Connections Act and the Family First Act recognize kinship navigation services as a vital tool for helping kinship families access services in their communities. However, even states that have developed a strong kinship navigator models have struggled to build an evidence base for these programs. Congress should authorize a quality improvement center that identifies the components of an effective navigator model and evaluation strategies that states can use to better serve families. Kinship families help keep children out of foster care and they deserve the same supports as foster parents. By adopting these recommendations, Congress can ensure that more children remain safe and stable with their own families. I'd like to thank Senator Patty Murray, the Office of Education and Help, and CCAI for the opportunity to speak with you today. Thank you. My name is David Samuel Hall. I'm a 23-year-old Oklahoman serving in Congressman Adam Smith's office. This dashing young man is also named David. He's eight and loves drawing dragons and watching cartoons after school. He takes pride in his button-up shirts and gelling his extremely thick hair. His greatest achievement is being the star of the Christmas recorder concert. David is a good kid who, just like every other boy, plays way too many video games. But because of what was going on at home, he was put into foster care. David eventually landed at Shadow Mountain, a psychiatric hospital. The atrocities he faced there peaked when four men picked him up, forcibly carried him, and tossed him into a room with a drain for a toilet, a cement floor for a bed, and glass walls for a view. David had less privacy and less dignity than a zoo animal. David's story, my story, is just as relevant now as it was when I was re-traumatized. That same place racked up over 120 child abuse allegations in recent years. And Oklahoma's Child Protection Agency still left kids to face the wrath of that hellhole this year. If we tied federal funding to a zero tolerance policy on child abuse in residential settings when little gel haired Scooby Doo watching David was there, and any time since, we wouldn't still be giving the federal stamp of approval for child abuse. This happens because we don't require agencies to do anything well, we just reward them for documenting poor outcomes. And because of this compliance-driven system, I was scarred. But life is even worse for children with disabilities. They're more likely to go into residential placements and become victims. But they wouldn't have to if we supported families to care for them at home. Right now, most states don't have specialized trainings to identify, let alone care for children with disabilities. If we want to bring kids out of institutions and into homes, the federal government needs to provide a national directory of trainings to help parents better identify and care for kids with disabilities. To bolster support for these young people, Congress should also mandate that kids in therapeutic foster care be given an individualized care plan like the Individualized Education Plan, which is used to inform teaching and classroom decisions for kids in special education. These plans would ensure better decisions about where a child lays their head down at night and focusing on meaningfully and significantly improving their quality of life, not just checking a box and calling it a day. An individualized care plan could be used for those aging out too. 
like one girl in my state with an IQ of 87 who's going to age out this summer and become homeless simply because our agency won't pay for the support she needs. An ICP would help prevent her from aging out without being prepared for success. I urge Congress to raise the bar off the ground so our kids aren't digging for it under their feet. It's time to stop publicly funded mediocrity and start intentionally providing a better life for children in foster care. Thank you. Hello, my name is Raya Esteves, and I'd first like to thank my loved ones, CCAI, and Congresswoman Vicki Hartzler's office for all of the contributions they have made to my development this summer. I am so lucky to have been adopted, or at least that is what people tell me when I share my story. I am grateful every day for the family I am a part of. However, when I was 11 years old, my brother posed the most impactful ultimatum of my life. Would you rather have infinite access to resources or change your last name? As a young girl who grew up to believe drugs were more important than me, who grew up too fast, taking care of my sister, parents, and myself, and who grew up to make a life-changing decision at the age of 11, this girl wanted nothing more than to be part of a real family. So I decided to become an Esteves. But changing my last name did not address the many adverse childhood experiences or ACEs I experienced in the years leading up to my adoption. Possessing four or more ACEs puts one at extreme risk to experience severe long-term social and emotional consequences. Studies have found that more than 50% of foster youth experience four or more ACEs. Among the many consequences of unaddressed ACEs, the process of identity formation is hindered. This can be a difficult and draining task for foster youth who may have never received closure from their biological family, came to terms with their experiences, or accepted their current situation. Throughout my life, I had to make decisions about who I was and how my story would shape me. Counseling was expensive for me and my family, making treatment unattainable. Yet as I grew older, I recognized how desperately I needed to heal from my past in order to live an overall healthy life. I learned to become resilient, but the consequences of my unaddressed trauma follow me through every stage of life due to the lack of support and intervention from the child welfare system. I encourage Congress to acknowledge their responsibility to the well-being of children beyond permanency by first requiring all states to implement a final needs assessment for the mental and emotional well-being of all youth achieving permanency to ensure success beyond placement. And second, requiring all states to offer emotional support services until the age of 26 to all youth, regardless of length of time and care, by amending Title IV-B to designate funds specifically to post-adoption assistance. Implementing these would allow youth to have a respectable amount of time to heal from their trauma, learn effective coping mechanisms, and continue on living an overall healthy life. Thank you. Transformation. The transformation of youth that have been through the, trial, the child welfare system can truly manifest in many different ways. Since my adoption at two and a half years old, I have lived in an environment surrounded by foster children as my foster parents have fostered over 120 kids and adopted seven of the 11 young people that have been through their house in their 45 years as foster parents. Whether we succeeded or we messed up, my family welcomed and accepted us. Due to my premature birth and substance abuse, I had underdeveloped lungs that required me to use a breathing treatment and inhalers early on in my life. And I'm so thankful for the family that continued to put a breathing mask on that little baby 20 years ago so that my lungs could fully develop. Today, 
I'm a Division I track athlete, and today I get to speak to you. Through my father's death, through my stubborn teenage years, and through getting to college and through high school, my mama Jan Jan has been there to provide support. What she hasn't always been able to do is provide financial support. Even as a committed foster parent, she still needs help to support her foster and adoptive children. On page 34 of my policy report, I outline three requests that will help young people and their families overcome boundaries to permanency. First, it is important that government mandated programs and practices contain positive outcomes. I'm asking that Congress include language in their next fiscal year 2020 appropriation package to scale a nationwide evidence-based program that is focused on um, recruitment, such as the Wendy's Wonderful Kids model. This program has demonstrated positive permanent outcomes for youth and has been shown to be 1.7 times more likely for kids to be adopted. This program is currently regionally focused but has the capacity to be fully integrated into systems nationwide. Secondly, I ask that Congress administer a national survey to both adopted youth and their parents during the first year of adoption. This would be used to identify post-adoption needs and gaps in support. And finally, several members of Congress, including my amazing host office this summer, Senator Roy Blunt of Missouri, have introduced the Adoption Tax Credit Refundability Act of 2019. Congress must eliminate financial barriers to adoption for foster care by making the tax credit fully refundable. I would not be where I am today without my adopted family's love and support, and my experience should not be an anomaly. I want to thank CCI's staff and network, as well as Senator Blunt and his amazing staff for this incredible opportunity. I want to thank my family that's here today, my sister, my niece, and my nephew who are in attendance, plus the entire crew back home. Finally, I want to thank everybody that's helped get me here today. Thank you. I remember being dropped off at college for my first day of freshman orientation. My first day in my college dorm was also my last day in a foster home. While I was surrounded by hundreds of people and their families that day, I felt oddly alone. Fortunately for me, I was not completely on my own. An independent living program funded through the John H. Chafee Foster Care Independence Program continued to provide me with financial assistance. My federally funded education and training voucher was used completely for my tuition, but the independent living program helped me with other essential expenses, such as my phone bill, food, and toiletries, through a monthly college stipend until I turned 21. Partly because of the help this program provided me, I was able to graduate college a year early and will be heading to law school in the fall. During my time at college, I also had the opportunity to participate in the Luzerne County Juvenile Justice Mentoring Program that allowed me to connect with others in foster care as both a mentor and a role model. Most of these foster youth dreamed of going to college but had very real concerns such as a lack of financial support and being able to keep up with their fellow students. Approximately 32% of foster youth apply to higher education institutions, but less than 10% make it to graduation day. These national data and the experiences of my mentees have driven my desire to help more foster youth achieve their goal of successfully completing training or education beyond their high school diploma. Today, I want to use my seat at this table to urge Congress to one, amend the Chafee program to extend financial assistance for current and former foster youth in higher education programs from 23 years of age to 26 years of age because education and training vouchers are often not enough to cover non-tuition expenses. Two, require states that receive Title IV-E foster care funding to provide educational workshops for foster youth that outline the extensive process of applying to and financing college, including information about the FAFSA, the availability of loans, and tutoring services. And finally, three, 
pass legislation that will streamline the process higher education institutions use to verify independent student status for financial aid by allowing a wider variety of sources to be used for verification purposes, as current Senate Bill 789 does. Making improvements such as these will help to eliminate some of the many obstacles foster youth experience during their college and ensure that foster youth have a chance at a brighter future. I would like to thank CCAI, my policy advisor Beth Kurtz, and Senator Bozeman's office for hosting me this summer. Thank you. I will never forget the day I was removed. My sister and I were put in the back of a patrol car and sent to an orphanage. I was living with my mother at a homeless shelter for victims affected by domestic violence. I asked myself, what did I do wrong? Is this my fault? Does my mom not want me? I was five years old. The punishment did not fit the crime. To this day, that messaging rings loud and clear. I, was, I knew other bad guys. They always sat in the back of the patrol car. So as I entered the child welfare system, in the back of a patrol car, I felt like a criminal. The threat of involvement with the justice system was always looming above me. And as a young person with many struggles stemming from the trauma of my childhood, it's almost as if I was destined to become a multi-system youth. And I did. In high school, I was playing with a toy gun, no larger than an eraser, when I got in trouble and I was immediately handcuffed outside of my classroom taken to the security parlor where I sat for the whole day, still handcuffed, while they thumbed through the pages of a book to find anything that they could possibly charge me with. It is too easy for this to happen to foster youth. The bar is set lower for multi-system youth, meaning that outcomes are worse. No national data exists on how many kids cross over from child welfare to the juvenile justice system and vice versa. In fact, multi-system involvement itself is, there's no consistent way or uniform way to monitor, track this multi-system involvement. The overall appropriations for delinquency prevention efforts have fallen in recent years. So states simply do not have the resources they need to focus on preventing and meeting the needs of youth who cross between these systems. And so I'm asking Congress for a three-part solution to this matter. First, to increase appropriations underneath the Juvenile Justice Delinquency Prevention Act, or JJDBA, to allow states to improve prevention programs for multi-system youth specifically, simply to bring appropriations closer to the authorized level. Second, to require that Title IV-E state plans include information on their efforts to provide prevention services for multi-system youth. And third, to request a report from the Government Accountability Office to examine the prevalence of this issue and to identify best practices. In the simplest sense, as a multi-system youth, I got lucky and I flourished and became the individual before you today. But while I'm fortunate, I recognize how easily it could have all fallen apart. My brothers and sisters deserve what I have, my happiness, my gratitude, and I wanna guarantee that they get it. And when I say brothers and sisters, I don't just mean in the metaphorical sense as foster youth. I literally mean my foster siblings. They had the exact same recipe that I did with very different outcomes. And if we understood this issue and funded prevention services for multi-system youth, then I might have never become involved with the justice system in the first place. And imagine where I'd be without the barriers that come with being a multi-system youth. Thank you. I never met my biological father. Uh, he was deported. I was raised by a single mother, with the only male role models being men coming in and out of prison, and a, and a mom who struggled with a drug addiction. Mom, you have a lot going on right now. I think it'd make it easier for you if you terminated your rights. This was the last exchange of words my 12-year-old self had with my mom. She died after overdosing when I was 18. These are the conditions that brought me into foster care. And while I was fortunate to be adopted from foster care, my adoptive home had instabilities. For most of middle school, 
my adopted mom had me sleep on the inside porch. In my story, permanency did not mean safety and security. Most likely, it would have been beneficial to have access to counseling services, as well as college and career readiness, mentorship after adoption occurred. I would have benefited from these career and college counseling services throughout my time in high school. The need for services after permanency doesn't end for any child. Therefore, Congress should extend the resources provided through the John H. Chafee Foster Care Independence Program to all individuals who have been adopted from the foster care system, regardless of age. 70% of foster youth want to attend college, and I'm proud to be one of the 2.7% of foster youth who have completed their bachelor's degree. It is my life goal to close this opportunity gap for others. I graduated Central Connecticut State University as one of two inspirational graduates of 2017, became an AmeriCorps alumni in Connecticut, and have since co-funded the grant-oriented uh, grant CCSU Care Scholars Program, which supports foster and adopted youth to graduate college. So imagine this. A former foster youth, adopted prior to the age of 16, is working multiple jobs to afford college and housing. They're up until 3 a.m. writing essays, and this student ends up failing out. You're heartbroken because you know if the financial burden of college was alleviated, they would work less and study more and still be in college. This is why Congress should expand the Educational Training Voucher, ETV, eligibility for youth adopted through foster care and kinship care from 14 years old to 18 years old. With the aforementioned needs, states continue to return appropriated Chafee funds every year, and we don't know why. Therefore, Congress should require Title IV-E agencies with unspent Chafee funds to report to HHS on the reasons the funds went unused. The reality is, if I wasn't born in Connecticut, I wouldn't be in this room. I was fortunate. State-based college funding programs in Connecticut made up for the gap that the federal government and Family First legislation doesn't go far enough to fill. Youth in every state, regardless of age at adoption, should have access to post-permanency supports and the opportunity to pursue post-secondary education. I would like to give thanks to Senator Klobuchar and everyone in their office, CCAI, Puchakaya, my mentor, my mentor Carlos, my policy advisor, Jen, and everybody in attendance today. To read my policy recommendation in full, you can go to page 40 of the uh, FOSS Youth Internship Report. Thank you so much. Child Protective Services took me out of the home of my drug-addicted parents when I was only eight years old. What followed was a chaotic period where I became isolated from my siblings and suffered significant instability. Even after going to live with my grandma and finding some stability, I still longed for a place where I could be recognized for my hard work and personal achievement. School became that space for me, and my passion for education eventually led me to pursue a college degree. I struggled with financial aid and housing and rarely felt emotionally supported through college. There were times when I felt unprepared for exams because I was preoccupied with navigating the challenges specific to me as a former foster youth in college. In the end, I was able to overcome these difficulties with the help of an admission staff member who is passionate about helping former foster youth. I achieved my dream of becoming a college graduate, but for many others in my situation, one or more of these obstacles would be enough to prevent them from graduating. There is a serious problem that affects a lot of foster youth. Only 20% will enroll in college and only 3% will earn a degree. This is a serious problem, and it's clear that something is getting in the way. However, there is good news. The laws designed to financially support foster youth are improving college enrollment. The bad news is they have no impact on graduation rates. Because programs in supporting former foster youth through college do not collect enough data, we do not have the information we need to address this problem. I would like to present the following policy recommendations to help Congress improve graduation rates for current and former foster youth. First, Congress should commission the Government Accountability Office to research and write a report 
on the outcomes for former foster youth in college. The report should include recommendations on how to improve their educational success and college completion rates. Second, create a national database to collect data related to college outcomes of former foster youth. All federal programs to support former foster youth in institutions of higher education should submit relevant data to the federal government. And third, establish and fund a competitive grant program through HHS to enable institutions of higher education to create, expand, and evaluate support programs for its students who are current and former foster youth. My experiences made it clear to me that former foster youth do not lack the potential for success, only the support to help them navigate their educational paths. I am here today to tell you that Congress must address this problem to ensure the long-term success of former foster youth. Thank you for listening to my policy recommendations, and thank you to CCI staff, my grandma, my two younger sisters, Haley and Courtney, that are here today, and Congressman Duffy for hosting me this summer. I've never felt so defeated until the day I received a call from the debt collector. It was the day I learned the art of negotiation, pleading that they wouldn't send the money that I owed in unpaid medical bills to my credit. Because a low credit score means that I'll be ineligible for student loans. And no student loans means I won't be able to finish my education. My name is Sheree Hickman, and I'm a graduate student at Washington University in St. Louis working on a master's in social work and another in social policy. Like a lot of students, my dream is to graduate. But every day, this dream is threatened by the thousands of dollars that I own debt. It took three years before I was officially diagnosed with epilepsy. Three years of medical bills, disruptions to my education, and struggles holding down a job that resulted in a significant amount of debt. At the time, I was not living in a state that had expanded Medicaid to include former foster youth. So now, at age 23, with a semester left until graduation, the lack of financial resources has hit me harder than ever before. It is estimated that 40% of former foster youth have outstanding debt that does not include education, home, or auto expenses. Yet the federal government has taken steps to provide financial literacy to former foster youth through the Chafee Foster Care Independence Program. And under Chafee, a separate source of funding was established for the Education and Training Voucher Program, which provides vouchers up to $5,000 a year to attend an institute of higher education. Although I participated in both programs, the financial training proved to be inadequate and the Education and Training Voucher Program failed to provide me support beyond tuition. Many states, however, have leveraged TAFI funding to combine financial literacy and the opportunity to save funds through programs called Individual Development Accounts, or IDAs. IDAs are similar to savings accounts in that foster youth who participate get to put a portion of their money, and that money grows over time. But the, the piece that makes IDAs unique is that once youth make a withdrawal from their account, that money is generally matched at a one-to-one -one ratio by public and private dollars to help fund tuition, housing, a vehicle, um, employment, and emergency expenses. While participating in the program, youth also have a range of financial literacy training from budget management to credit score maintenance. Congress has a unique opportunity to expand and support individual development accounts for foster youth through three key policy recommendations. First, requires states to designate at least 10% of their Chafee funding to programs that help youth transition out of care to become financially independent. Second, enhance the education and training voucher program by increasing funding to accommodate all eligible youth and allowing eligible youth participating in edu education-based IDA programs to place up to $1,000 of their vouchers into their accounts. Finally, develop a tax credit to incentivize individuals and corporations to fund IDA, IDAs for foster youth. If I had access to an IDA program, I am certain that the funds that I have saved
would have covered a significant portion of my medical debt and given me the skills to manage my finances. I would like to thank CCAI, Child Focus, my policy advisor, Ann De Leong, my CASA, Tammy Doom, my senator that hosted me this summer, um, Senator Ron Wyden, and the Senate Finance Committee. Thank you so much for your time. We'll have our FYIs close us out in just a moment, but we wanted to acknowledge Senator Wyden from Oregon, the ranking member on Senate Finance. <laughs> Thank you very much, and it would be cruel and unusual punishment to give you a big speech, and I am not gonna inflict that kind of torment on you. And I'm going to do a little bragging about Cherie in just a moment. But I want you also to know you've got with you of my generation, I'm a bit older, but of my generation, two really extraordinary advocates for foster kids. One of them is my former colleague, Senator Mary Landrieu, chair of the Energy and Natural Resources <laughs> Committee. And she stood powerfully for vulnerable kids when she's in the Senate, and she's still doing it as chair of the board. So we're very appreciative of that. And also in the front row is Russ Sullivan, who was a staff director of the Senate Finance Committee and was constantly, year in and year out, looking for ways to push the rock up the hill to create more opportunities for vulnerable young people. And that's, I think, where I want to come in just very briefly because it kind of relates to Cherie's um, good work. When Chairman Baucus retired and went to China, um, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, I became the senior Democrat and eventually the chair of the Senate um, Finance uh, Committee prompting my wife to say, well, just goes to show you, even a blind squirrel finds an acorn once in a while. And one of the things that we thought about was how to really be bold and creative with respect to vulnerable young people. And it became clear, some of you, I think, are very familiar with the writing and work of Marion Wright Edelman uh, of the Children's Defense Fund. And it very much affected my thinking because it was clear that vulnerable young people, by and large, would have two options. One, they could stay in a home situation which was less than ideal. Maybe a parent had gotten caught up with drugs or alcohol or something, but suffice it to say, it wasn't ideal. Or they could, in effect, be sent off to a foster care facility. And everybody in this room knows that there are some good foster care facilities, and there are some that regrettably have not been up to the standards that all of you as advocates have fought for. So what we decided to do in the Senate Finance Committee on a bipartisan basis, because as Chair Landrieu and Russ Sullivan know, you can't do anything important really unless it's bipartisan. So what we did is we said, we got these two options out there that aren't ideal. Keep the young person in a home, even when the situation isn't so great, or send them off to a foster care facility. Take your chances. Might be good, might not. We created a third option, and it was called Families First. And it was, in effect, what Marion Wright Edelman and a number of other leaders had been dreaming about, in her words, for three decades. And what this third option really said is for the first time the federal government would try to help the family extricate themselves from this horrible situation. So that, for example, the parent would be in a position to get help um, with uh, beating their addiction or uh, opioids. In many instances, there might be a grandparent available for what was called kinship care. And the grandparent could step in and be reimbursed for care. 
So we created this third path. And now, all across the country, there is excitement at the state level for this third path and the potential to basically create more options for young people and families. I particularly am very proud of the kinship care concept because when I was a young man and I had a full head of hair and rugged good looks, I was head of the senior citizens, the Great Panthers, and that's when we started getting going this kinship care. So it's very exciting. So then along comes to our office, to our great good fortune, Cherie Hickman, who has what I thought from day one was a really appealing idea when she said, you know, what we have to do, Senator, and around here, if they call you Senator, by and large, it's not going to be that good because, like, you know, titles and all that kind of thing. What we have to do is we have to do more to support older foster youth. And I said, huh, that sounds interesting. Tell me a little about it. So Cherie, as she mentioned to all of you, talked, for example, about how foster youth were up to their eyeballs in a lot of instances with medical debt. And the first time I heard about it, I said, Cherie, how can that be? Aren't they eligible for Medicaid? Well, in some instances they are, in some instances they aren't. But as Cherie said, she's one of the people who's up to her eyeballs in medical debt. And then you have foster youth who don't have the savings to be in a position, for example, to transition to new careers. So in addition to being an outstanding um, partner in our effort in uh, the office, I really like this idea. I think this is show-stopping material because if you don't create more options for young people, when young people have had, for example, and Cherie is talking to me about what she's doing at Washington University, if they don't have opportunities to keep growing, we all know that youth can kind of slide back and, in effect, rack up more debt and you know who knows what else they can get caught up in. So I will just close by way of saying, I guess you're going to have questions and I can hang around for a few minutes. I think Cherie Hickman's the wave of the future. I think this is an extraordinary young woman who's on to a vitally important idea where instead of in government, we just say, everything's done wrapped up, mission accomplished, Cherie says, uh, excuse me, not so fast. There are a lot of us who are headed in the right direction, but we're going to need some work to really get there and be the leaders of the future and the senators and the business leaders and all the rest. So I just want you to know I'm thrilled to have a chance um, to come. When I was um, in the Senate with Senator Landrieu, she talked me into always being a supporter of the adoption tax credit, which Mr. Sullivan was a ringleader for year after year after year. So big, big thanks for the wonderful work you're doing. Thank you for bringing Cherie Hickman to our office because uh, we have, I think, watched her develop this idea that I think looking down the road is going to really put these vulnerable youngsters and their families on the right side of history. Thanks for having me. Let's put this to be continued. Thanks, everybody. Once again, my name is Mackenzie McGeehan, and I want to thank all members of Congress and their staff present today, all of the policy advisors, and the dedicated people at Child Focus and CCAI. Given our backgrounds as former foster youth, it is easy to see how each of the 12 interns at this table are so invested in child welfare. However, I believe our investment comes from somewhere more than just our pasts. While today we all identify as former foster youth, this label only describes a small part of our stories. We are teachers, caseworkers, advocates, future lawyers, and politicians. 
We are Republicans, Democrats, and Independents. Our passion comes from far more than our experiences alone. It comes from a desire to offer foster children the same opportunities that their peers are offered. It comes from an internal knowledge that while it is wonderful for us as individuals to have graduated college and be labeled the exceptions for doing so, that label ultimately signifies a failure of the child welfare system. Child welfare is a bipartisan issue. It is not left or right as many issues are today. It is a fight to defend those whose voices aren't quite loud enough to fight for themselves. It is a fight to be the voice that over 400,000 children in foster care need. We are honored to have been given the opportunity to be that voice here today and honored that so many people outside of the child welfare system are willing to fight alongside of us. Thank you again for being here and listening to our stories and concerns that have shaped us into the young advocates we are today. Thank you. And now next, I will introduce Joshua Christian with the Q&A portion of our briefing. So now we're going to take some time to open it up for any questions or comments you may have for us. We're going to have two CCI, CCAI interns walking around with microphones. Uh, you may direct your questions to any individual, including myself, or the whole group as a whole. I will note, if there are any inappropriate questions that I think will be harmful for the group, I will skip over them. So uh, at this time, I want to open it up for questions. <laughs> John Shimano with the Child Welfare League of America. Uh, just curious, as you all started your internship, you had some ideas of what you wanted to study. Is there anything you learned over the course of the last several weeks that really kind of surprised you or influenced uh, what your final recommendations were? Just open to anybody, I guess. Um, David. Um, I would say the surprising amount of things that aren't already law. Um, right. So again, with disabilities, right, we did IDEA way back when, ADA um, a little bit uh, with that. And we still have a third of the population in foster care with disabilities, and we don't have law on foster care about kids in care with disabilities. Right. It's a very large population, and there's been no law to address it. Um, so uh, just that was, I think, the biggest thing to me. Did Lena want to go? I guess I'll go. Um, I think one of the most impactful things that I've learned is that as you increase regulations, you decrease your capacity to enforce a law. And that really honed in, and it's that federalism issue, issue of the conundrum of how can we get something done and enforce states to do something, but also painting them with the broad stroke um, to be accommodating for the situations that we can't anticipate. And getting to the local and federal policy to apply down on a local level, I think, is a conundrum that is significantly misunderstood on a massive scale. And that was something that I completely did not know about until coming here, until having that exposure to legislation. Anyone else? Right there. Thank you. Megan Thompson with Senator Rosen's office. I've also heard a lot about, um, you talked a little bit about mental health and other health needs, um, but the care coordination for foster youth is something that um, we've been looking at for a while, and I've never gotten a straight answer for 
who should be coordinating that? Should it be the Medicaid? Should it be your social worker? So I'd love to hear from you. Who should have that responsibility to make sure you're getting counseling, that you're seeing the same pediatrician, that your foster family knows if you have asthma? David, do you want to go? One word, both. I think I want to... Uh, you go, you go first. I think I want to piggyback on that. I think um, uh, us young people at the table and everyone else out there, um, a lot of times um, people will, will try to think of like, well, this person should have this responsibility or this one should have this responsibility. But all the times, um, these systems are intertwining with each other. And until we, I think if we increase that communication right there, then we can truly be gearing our resources towards the young person. Um, do you if my light will turn on um, I think another thing that policymakers and people that are trying to discover a lot of these things run into um, is that there's no data on on like whether those things are happening um, and that's because many of our um, the many of the services that are provided um, monitor like the, those different extraneous things. They, they monitor you know, the demographics of the youth that are in the system, but they don't monitor um, how youth are receiving treatment and some of those things that can be used for data um, and national data. Did you have a question? I'm Terry Landrew, happy to be here and welcome everyone uh, as the chair of this amazing board. Raise your hand. Okay, so about half of you, raise them high, about half. Could one or two of you comment on how that worked for you or didn't work? Um, Mackenzie, then Anna. So um, I actually interned underneath a judge and I did an entire project based on um, us. Uh, foster youth about uh, where I asked them how they appreciated their guardian ad litem, if they wished there was something else they could do for them, where I compiled their names anonymously and actually uh, re-provided it out to the guardians ad litem so they could sort of hopefully improve on what they were doing. Um, and I know that while I had an absolutely wonderful experience with my guardian ad litem, many of the foster children in my county do not. They believe that Guardians ad litem are very distant. They're very, we're here because we have to be, not because we want to be. That that passion has faded from their, from their eyes and from their jobs that I want to, really want to help out children. Um, but I've heard amazing things about the CASA workers, on the other hand. While I've never had one, I've heard that they are basically doing what the guardians ad litem should be doing in the court. Um, throughout my time in care, I had a lot of guardian ad litems. Um, like many other things, there's a high turnover rate. Um, and to my understanding, my guardian ad litem was a volunteer. And I will say that while my guardian ad litem was helpful, they do have restrictions and limitations on how they can help you. Um, so maybe evaluating that. And also in Florida, I worked on recruitment um, material for guardian ad litems because we're not providing a, a diverse pool of guardian ad litems for the children that we have in foster care. Sheree. Hi. Um, can you guys hear me okay? Okay. Um, so yeah, my CASA is actually here today. Um, and so I'm from California and I entered care when I was 16. Um, and I've been through a lot of placements and about like three different social workers, but my CASA has filled in gaps that I can't really 
like expound on. Um, in California, we have a very loose kind of, we don't really have as many restrictions as in other states in which CASAs can and can't do. So, um, you know, my CASA, you know, kind of took me to appointments or, you know, moved me into my college dorm, helped me pay for stuff. Um, but I also went to school in Arkansas where they did have really restrictive um, CASA laws. And in Arkansas, they, every child has a CASA. So that means that CASAs, kind of like social workers, are having multiple caseloads um, of youth. Whereas in California, one, one CASA is assigned to one child or a sibling group. So like Anna was saying, I really do think that we need to like look at how we kind of place those restrictions and like which model is working best so that child can get that one-on-one -on -one attention that they do need so they can be successful. We have time for about... We have time for about two more questions. Um, and after this, uh, we're gonna be sticking around. If you wanna approach us one-on-one, -on -one, that's totally fine too. Um, over here. Hi, this question's actually for you. So I'm a school social worker in Kansas, and it's for a Title I school. So our district just a year ago hired social workers to come in to work with students based on behavioral health and mental health. How would you ensure, if this went through, how could Congress or the Senate ensure that teachers were adequately getting the training for trauma and how could you monitor that they were utilizing that with students? Yeah, um, so I think um, uh, if the act would pass and teachers would be required to have this training, um, I think it would help uh, young people, especially um, when, they're, when they're growing up through care, because oftentimes we're kind of focusing on the needs of young people when we're aging out of care, or, or just, for me, it was a domino effect, really. Uh, from first grade and up, if I would have um, received services at a young age, maybe I wouldn't have um, uh, graduated high school barely not knowing how to write a paper, right? Um, so I think um, if we were to implement it and teachers were to be able to um, have this training, they could um, be able to help the kids more um, in uh, their education. And what was the other piece to your question? Um, Chris, do you want to answer that piece? Uh, I think I think that would be a really uh, in complex answer. So if you want to talk to me one-on-one -on -one, um, after this, I'd love to. But Chris, did you want to respond to? Yeah. Um, so for what it's worth, I might be postulating a little bit, but I used to be a school teacher. I taught fifth grade. And so I think first and foremost, so the school district I was in was high needs, inner city. And so we were required to do trauma-informed instruction, and we would go through trauma-informed training. And so... Teaching is already a highly evaluated like profession right now, so I don't know if this, how this would be implemented in the sense of, again, this is why I think I'm postulating, but how this would be implemented in an effective way that doesn't overburden the teacher as well, but potentially through um, the classroom advising, when, when you have a principal come in and sit down and you're evaluated in that sense, it could just be one more metric. Like, do they notice trauma-informed instruction if it's necessary in that instance? Is there something going on? Do you have a foster youth in this particular setting? Um, that he is currently showing high-risk behavior, and did that teacher respond with a trauma-informed approach? And so that would probably be the most like restrictive pathway to implementing that. Uh, Anthony, did you have a comment? As someone who will have their MSW in four months, and someone who's published in the Neurobiology of Trauma, trauma gives you a very unique skill set, not one I'm recommending any of you go get, However, <laughs> utilizing that skill set instead of trying to force youth to adopt a whole new skill set goes a long way to helping their brain uh, form around something they already know. You make those connections from a negative to a positive. So instead of being like, oh, you're hypervigilant, we can't have you in class. Okay, hey, go take a lap, come back, sit down, do something like that. Pay attention to what that skill set is and what that can actually be used as, as a positive rather than looking at it as a barrier to success of these youth. And that's one way you can actually do it. Is, are these teachers um, actually utilizing the skill set rather than saying, okay, shove 40 youth into a classroom 
okay, are they, you know, teaching math through a basketball court or whatever? Like, what different tools are they using rather than just saying, oh, the district is tying my hands and this is too hard for me, so I'm suspending the youth? We have time for one more question. We'll do him to him. Go ahead. We'll, we'll, we'll group back around for you. I'm a former um, FYI alum from 2017, so great work. I just want to sign up. My, my, my question is pertaining to education. Um, so could someone f sort of walk me through, and I, I, many of, I think it was about two or three of you who had recommendations based on education. Could you walk me through the difference of the outcomes of the general population and the outcomes of, of, of foster youth? Chris, go ahead. Thank you. Cool. I was just waiting for the light to go on the microphone. Um, yeah, so that's an incredible question, one that's really important to acknowledge. And part of it is, is we see no larger disparity. Um, I'm going to sp speak specifically on post-secondary education outcomes, so higher education. We see no larger disparity as far as graduation outcomes than with foster youth. And so um, by the age of 25, only 2.7% of foster youth will receive, former foster youth will receive their bachelor's degree. This is in comparison to about 30 to 40% of the traditional population. So when I say traditional, I mean uh, typical full family households, middle class income, and uh, that's a huge disparity. Um, even when you look at low income households, it's about 11% graduation rate. So even when you control for income or when you're considering that variable, we still see a bigger disparity with former foster youth and former adopted youth as far as post-secondary education outcomes than uh, we see even with other traditional students and low-income college students, and which is kind of why it fills the void. And just to kind of say one more thing on that, it's, it's if we don't pay for it now, we pay for it later, right? So we also know that there's incredibly high incarceration rates. About by age of 21, 14 to 15% of foster youth will experience incarceration. They'll experience, about 20% will experience homelessness. Um, homelessness is really expensive. Incarceration is really expensive. So instead of having a tax deficit, if we invest now in education and these other different ways that uh, empower someone and help them become a productive member of society, then you become a tax surplus. I think I'm much better in this world as a tax surplus than a deficit. Uh, and and just real quick, if anybody comes to me afterwards and they would like these statistics, I'm more than happy to share any sources. Anthony, did you want to make a comment? Yeah. In addition, we don't look at youth who've been through trauma has, has needing extra support. Oh, if, you, if you're special needs, then you get an IEP and all this stuff. If you've been through trauma, then you're a burden to your classroom. You're a barrier to your teacher having a, a successful classroom. And so rather than looking at them as, as a burden, look at them as someone who needs support like we do with veterans, like we do with anyone else uh, who doesn't come from a traditional background and is in education, whether that's K through 12 or post-secondary, and give them that support. Um, I'm a veteran and a foster youth and um, have an A score of 10, and yet here I am about to graduate with my master's degree, an accomplishment that should have never been warranted. And so, you know, it is possible. It's just what frame uh, of mind do you use when you're approaching these youth? Great, thank you. Um, there's still more, I saw more hands in the audience. Um, oh, go ahead, Alex. So I'd just like to add that if you look at um, former foster youth in higher education and just the data that exists um, on the outcomes of former foster youth, it doesn't really exist. And we really base what we know on a study from 2011 in the Midwest, which doesn't account for what it looks like across the United States and also doesn't account for what it looks like now. We're collecting data on disadvantaged groups, racial groups, first generation, low income, but we're not collecting data on foster youth. So how are we supposed to address the problem if we don't have the evidence to address it? And so that's something that really needs to change and that's across higher education and also um, you know, in high school, in, in elementary school, we don't have that data to address the problem. Uh, Anna, did you have a quick comment? Um, I didn't do my policy report on higher education, but I just want to reflect on my experience in Florida. 
Um, I received a full ride um, to college, and I get free tuition until I'm 28. And as, as I reflect on um, the stories of my peers, they weren't offered um, this. And I also received additional support until I was 23. So that's, those support services made sure that I was successful in my matriculation throughout college. In addition, my campus established a liaison, and that person was um, responsible for making sure that my financial aid documents um, got through and was processed and things like that. So I think that if you're sitting in here wondering what you can do to help us obtain higher education, that it will be, of course, funding and establishing that, that person on campus for these youth. Great. Thank you. Do, give, a, give these guys a round of hand and applause. At this time, I want to welcome um, Bethany Haley up to the stage. So thank you all so much for being so generous with your time today. This was always my favorite event of the year when I was on the Hill because it's a long briefing, but it's so jam-packed with good information. Um, and I happen to know that a couple of the staff who have brought past policy recommendations and carry them for, forward into law are actually here in the room. And so I just wanted to make a note about that before I bring Russ up here to close us out. And that is, um, it's all in your hands, basically. These are only recommendations until someone decides to um, connect with the FYI after you leave this room and try to carry it forward into policy. And so we hope that you'll join us in the reception. We have an hour-long reception in the back of the room, and please don't leave before connecting with at least one of these um, awesome people uh, who've become part of the CCI family this, this year. Um, and with that, I'll bring Russ up. Now, there's a couple of people uh, I think we need to acknowledge that will facilitate the reception that we're going to have in the back. First of all, if you are not from Washington, D.C., if you are a family member of one, to, one of these young men or women up here, you were a teacher, you were a CASA, you were a guardian ad litem, you helped them on their journey, we want you to stand right now. We want to thank you. We want to be able to introduce them to you. Thank you all for coming and for your support. Thank you very much. Second, there are a number of offices here in the Congress who invested a lot of time in these young people today. You saw a little bit of that today with Congresswoman Underwood and Senator Wyden here and uh, Representative Hartzler. Uh, so I want to acknowledge those of you who work for some of them. So let's first start in the House of Representatives. We, we have six offices that help facilitate their internship. So if you work for Congresswoman Hartzler, Congresswoman Underwood, Congressman James Langevin, Congressman Richie Neal at the Ways and Means Committee, uh, Congressman Adam Smith or Congressman Sean Duffy, and you're here in the audience today, if you would please stand so that they can thank you today. Thank you. We also have six offices in the Senate that have taken these uh, students and given them the opportunity. So if you work for Senator Wyden at the Finance Committee or Senator Grassley at the Finance Committee or Senator Murray at the Help Committee or you work for Senator Klobuchar or Senator Blunt or Senator one more. Bozeman, yeah. Uh, if you are here today or you are another Senate staffer here just to learn, if you would stand, appreciate it. We would like to recognize you today. Thank you all for coming. Now, 
we're not gonna bum rush the stage here. We're gonna ask you all to go that way. They've gotta get their pictures made by the press real briefly here. We would like any of you who are former foster youth who are here, if you would come up here, gonna take a couple of pictures, then they will join you. You all may begin the reception now. Thank you very much.